It's a great pleasure uh, to be here, uh, not uh, in the least because the last time was uh, a bit problematic. Uh, I think you remember the 5th of December where um, nothing much happened that uh, uh, was planned. Uh, and so today it's a great pleasure uh, to be able to talk to future agriculture uh, at SLU. And um, I'm hoping that we can have more uh, opportunities to interact since I'm uh, just across the way at CBN. What I would like to do today is to give you some historical background and then show you what we're doing with that historical background for a particular region. And this is the uh, area in Burgundy in France that I work. First of all, uh, CBN uh, has three pillars of its activity, uh, traditional knowledge uh, and local knowledge, um, uh, politics and policy, and historical ecology. And for those of you who are not as familiar as you might like to uh, what historical ecology might be, this is sort of the short answer. It's taking all of the ways that we understand the history of our planet, uh, which includes everything from geology to genetics, uh, with all the different ways that we can understand uh, human activity, of which there are, of course, uh, very many as well. Uh, this is an integrative framework, uh, which is drawn very strongly from the environmental sciences, uh, but also from archaeology, which pretty much needs all of that information to do its work, uh, and from ecology, anthropology, and geography. So we link human and earth system history. We don't keep them separate. We try and see uh, what kinds of dialectical relationships we can observe uh, between those bodies of knowledge. Uh, and the perspective is one that uh, is pragmatic, one that uh, we can take to the field with, with us, and holistic. We take, uh, as was mentioned, a pretty broad temporal and spatial breadth. Uh, we're looking at human activity from uh, two and a half million years ago, uh, right up to the present and we're doing it all over the planet. So these are not sort of small undertakings, and as you might imagine, uh, there is a lot of reason to collaborate with one's colleagues because it's not possible, I think, to be um, knowledgeable in all the different fields we would have to know to be able to do this kind of work. But uh, because we have a respect for all of the different data sets and, uh, and ways of knowing, uh, we can not only use it as a cross-check uh, in, uh, in our examination of a circumstance, but we can also build consensus across fields of study. Uh, landscapes are particularly important uh, to historical ecology because that's the scale uh, at which we have a lot of that information. Uh, for those of you who, are, uh, who consider yourself uh, field-based scientists, uh, I think that, uh, that you might appreciate uh, how important it really is to have uh, those uh, physical processes and structures um, on the ground, in the ground, uh, to be able to understand what uh, not only has happened in the past, but what you can do with that piece of land. Uh, we've been at it for a long time, we humans, uh, over two million years. Uh, we may have started small in uh, changing predator-prey relationships or uh, modifying forests or whatever, uh, but of course we've gone on to uh, much uh, bigger activities. And we have to remember nonetheless that the history of landscapes um, invariably shapes their future. Uh, what kinds of initial conditions we find in terms, for example, of geology or the particular climate of an area. Uh, but also the path dependence, if you will, of these very complex systems. Uh, so that, for, for example, if you want to know um, something about uh, the possibilities of, uh, of using soil in an area in a certain kind of way, uh, it's a good thing to start with the history of the way that that soil has uh, been dealt with in the past. Those previous management uh, elements then continue to be with us and continue to be available for study. Uh, 
my own work has uh, pretty much always been in Europe. I uh, started in uh, studying North American archaeology, but um, qu very quickly moved to Europe. And uh, I've worked in a lot of different countries in Europe uh, doing archaeology and anthropology uh, and ecology, uh, but uh, I consider France probably the basis of most of my work. The reason that we started thinking about the entire agrarian history of Europe um, has to do with Burgundy's future. And I would like to explain that to you and uh, also you give, give you some of our ideas about uh, what kinds of changes in the common agricultural policy uh, could um, assure uh, the continuity uh, of the Burgundian landscape uh, productivity. So by about 6,000 years ago, uh, most of the plants and animals that uh, became uh, a staple for uh, European societies were already in place, but they came from a lot of different places. And uh, they had also been uh, pretty heavily modified in the couple thousand years just before 6,000 years ago. So we're looking at something like 4,000 BC, but back through probably up until maybe seven or 8,000 BC, uh, there were uh, farmers and herders and, and other individuals, fishers, uh, who had already been modifying the species that, uh, that they were exploiting. So this is the foundation, if you will, of European agriculture, uh, certainly up until uh, after World War II. Uh, Many of the species that, uh, that we now consider European were first domesticated in the Middle East, and there are two main ways that, uh, that those species entered Europe. Uh, one is a sort of a, a, top, a top one that brings um, uh, species in uh, to uh, Northeast and Northwest Europe, and uh, then uh, people moving along the upper side of the Mediterranean basin and uh, also bringing species with them. The, uh, the history then of European agriculture uh, is uh, a, a pretty, uh, it, it's certainly not an easy thing to have done, but it is, uh, it is something that we can learn from in the sense that what we're looking at is a uh, modification, um, behaviorally, genetically, uh, and, and uh, in terms of, uh, of the activities that, uh, that surround different plants and animals, that was a sort of a co-evolution, if you will, uh, of the humans uh, with the species that, uh, that they were working with. And what this did, <laughs> was allow those farmers and herders to adjust those species to what is a rather difficult uh, European climatic circumstance, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. All of that, of course, then reduced their risk, and that's what they were really uh, trying, trying to do, so that the better they knew uh, the species they were working with and the better adapted those species were to difficult conditions, the more likely they were going to be successful uh, uh, in growing them. So um, species are, of course, still uh, showing up on European shores. Uh, the tomato came from Central America uh, in the 16th century, and the potato uh, from South America, also in the 16th century. Uh, I'd, I'd like to draw your attention. I don't know whether you can see it or not. This is a picture of a farm uh, probably about the 1930s in France. And you first think that, well, this is Burgundy. Those are probably white Charolais. But actually, these are hogs. Uh, and uh, I, it's just to point out that you're looking uh, in, the, in a lot of these old photographs at, uh, at varieties that are, no longer, that are no longer grown. The work that we've been doing uh, has been, uh, first of all, uh, this is Burgundy. It's made up of four departments. You probably know it because of the wine that's on the east side of those four departments uh, where calcareous soils uh, make vineyards um, very... Uh, very luxuriant. Uh, 
Uh, but on the west side where uh, we've been working, uh, the geology is, uh, is granite and um, we're looking at a history of several thousand years uh, of, um, uh, of animal husbandry uh, in that area. That's essentially what the land is good for. It's, uh, uh, the, uh, the soil is fairly thin and uh, easily erodible, and I'll talk a little bit about that too in a few minutes. We um, put of all, all of our information, we have a lot of spatial information over that time period. The, we really focus, I must admit, on about the last uh, two to 3,000 years, but that probably doesn't help too much in terms of reducing the amount uh, of material that we have to be able to manage. And so we use a, a GIS uh, system with uh, about 150 layers now, so it's a big one. What I would like to do is talk just a little bit about the climate history of Europe, which is um, I'm going to figure in to what I have to say in a few minutes. First of all, um, we are interested in looking at climate history at a, at a lot of different scales. Uh, and uh, this is important to think about because uh, climate happens to us like it did to me on the 5th of December. Uh, at, in a very local fashion. But one of the things that we always hear about uh, without too much discussion of what goes in between uh, is global climate. And so what I'd like to do is just say a few things about uh, European climate uh, at the global and northern hemisphere level. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Um, the... Uh, this is about 2,000 years ago. This is the Roman warm period. As you see, it's uh, quite warm. And then in the, the so-called, what are sometimes called the Dark Ages, the migration period after the collapse of the Western Empire, uh, there's uh, quite a cold period. There's another warm period around the year 1,000. And um, then things get cold again between about 1,300 and about 1,850 or so. Uh, down here, and if we were looking at contemporary temperatures, we would be up in here again. Uh, this is a different way to look at it. Here's the Pleistocene, uh, when uh, pretty much all of Europe was uh, under snow and ice. Uh, a couple of bumps. This is uh, sometimes uh, an important area, uh, time period in the Holocene, looking at two sort of warm bumps that uh, certainly had an effect on the history of European agriculture. And here's that Roman period, warm here, which allowed the Romans to expand uh, essentially Mediterranean crops and animals uh, much further north. Here's the medieval warm period, here's the little ice age, and here we go off into hot times. Uh, at a regional level, uh, this is some work that I did a few years ago that um, allowed us to look at what kind of variation happens uh, across Europe. So, uh, sorry. The, uh, the period from around 1200 BC to 300 BC, uh, you see these three climatic regimes, continental, which has the high up in Siberia, uh, the maritime or uh, Atlantic, uh, which has its high over in Canada, and the Mediterranean, which has its high over in the Azores. And these three climate regimes kind of move around uh, over Europe over time. So this is a fairly cold period, and so these two colder regimes, the, the, uh, the ocean one and the continental one, um, the line that divides them from the subtropical Mediterranean regime is way down here uh, in this time period. But you see in that, in that Roman period warm bump, it's way up here, which is how the Romans were able to grow grapes uh, in uh, the British Isles. Uh, by that time that, uh, that the cold period called the migration period or the dark ages, uh, this line is way down here. It's sitting on top of the edge of Alexandria there in Egypt. And uh, to get an idea of how important this is, the Nile froze in AD 829. So this is not, you know, 
just getting caught on the train once. It's a, it was a very, very cold time period and it changed a lot of things, including where things grew. So here is the range of climate variation just, just in about a thousand years. And so this is what uh, European farmers were facing when they had to think about, and we can look at uh, additional variation that, uh, that comes down to the regional and sub-regional level. Uh, first of all, looking at the, the geological strata uh, and the geomorphological changes that occur in the major river valleys in that area. We can reconstruct all of that. We can also collect pollen and uh, put together a pretty good uh, record of all of the changes uh, in the rivers in an area and, um, and a fairly good uh, temperature pro proxy as well. Uh, then at the very local scale, this is a kind of a sweet little chateau that sits on an island in the middle of a pond which we now know has been there for the last thousand years. And uh, what we did, this is, this is our team here uh, in our boat, we took uh, corings from the pond and we've had those analyzed by Marie-José Gallard at, uh, in Kalmar. And uh, what we now have is a thousand years of the management of that pond and the surrounding agricultural lands. So we know what they were growing, uh, we know when they were growing it, they know, we know when they grew forests and when they cut them down, and we have the climate record next to it to begin to understand that sort of uh, co-evolution of that, those activities. Um, the, there's also a long oak chronology that is by dendrochronology uh, allows us to uh, reconstitute all of uh, Burgundy's uh, climate history, basically. So we have uh, some nice ways then to go all the way from the sort of the global things that we hear about with reference to climate down to the local and bring that home. And so what I'm trying to do really is to look at that long, long-term history and to lay it against the climate data to see what people did, when they did it, how it came out for them and to get a richer understanding of what sorts of climate changes will happen next. Because um, as has been famously said by uh, uh, several climatologists, uh, we, every region has been through the climate of uh, their future. And so what we're trying to do then is to look at extreme events, what are called excursions in the climate record. Uh, so this is, this is what the lands, landscape, I'm sorry about that, I, there, back, back, there. Uh, uh, look at the landscape then, uh, you can see that uh, Burgundy here is a sort of a mosaic of uh, farms and uh, ponds and uh, woodlots and, uh, and forests. Uh, and uh, just to the north, the Paris Basin uh, is, is pretty much denuded. Uh, and a, a part of this has to do with the, with the geology of those two regions. The geology is very different, and also this is a very, uh, it's a very hilly region, and this one is pretty flat. Uh, we've done a lot of archaeological work. Uh, this uh, is um, a, um, uh, a gravel pit uh, that uh, is using the Pleistocene gravels of this little river valley here, uh, and right here, is a blow up of uh, one of the Roman villas that sat next to uh, that, um, that river uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, we've also studied 2,400 years of occupation on this mountain that is just nearby here. And what this allows us to do then is to understand what people were doing in the area, but then we have to fan out and uh, do uh, field work all across that landscape to get an idea about how different parts of that landscape were being used. And so what we're doing then is to try and put uh, this site, Mont Dardon, in context of the kinds of changing agricultural activities that were going on in the area. We also use a lot of documentary evidence uh, fortunately, the French are quite fanatical about their records, and uh, we have uh, we have um, uh, 
documents uh, from uh, the 11th, 12th century, but we also have uh, a record of everyone who was born, who got married, or who died uh, in this particular parish because these records um, start in the late 1500s. And uh, that tells us not only what farm they lived on, but uh, what they did for a living. Were they, were they, did they shoe horses, or did they, were they farmers, or did they work uh, in the forest? And we're able then to look very clearly at the ways that uh, during these rather radical climatic uh, periods, uh, the population fluctuated. So in, in some ways, this is pre-railroads and pre mm, any, uh, any amount of good roads. And uh, what that allows us to do then is to see uh, how people who are relying on a, on a local resource uh, are faring in, uh, in, these, in these difficult periods. One of the things that came out of this is uh, something that is quite interesting. We think of the Romans as doing everything right, except for the end, of course. But, um, you know, they, they invented concrete. Uh, they brought water from hundreds of miles away for their cities. They did all sorts of things that were uh, pretty uh, impressive. Uh, but if you look at the, the cities that, uh, that Roman agriculture or Roman controlled agriculture uh, were controlling, there are lots of them and they were full of hungry people because one of the things that Rome did was to ensure that its citizens and its slaves, you have to feed your slaves, uh, had enough to eat. And so their big concern was always wheat and uh, where they were going to get it next. And so you can trace around the Roman bread baskets as they sort of um, exploit a particular area for its wheat, and then something goes wrong there and they move somewhere else. And so uh, to keep the empire fed, this becomes uh, an, an enormously uh, difficult task. And so in the whole last three millennia, the Romans did the worst job of manning their, managing their own agricultural lands. And uh, they had these bread baskets all over the empire. You know, Egypt was a bread basket, so was Sicily uh, uh, producing, uh, producing wheat for them. And so much so that they, you could argue that they were monocropping wheat uh, on a large scale. Uh, a lot of the things that Celtic peoples, the people who lived there in the Iron Age, the period before the Romans, already knew about agriculture, the Romans didn't bother to follow very much of that. Uh, they uh, um, didn't do field re rotation. Uh, they didn't pay uh, very much term, uh, uh, attention to the long term. Uh, there was a lot of erosion, which we know by looking at the geology next to the rivers. Uh, and uh, what was worse, beginning around AD uh, 270, uh, the climate began to get um, pretty erratic. And if you think about it, people can adapt to anything. They can adapt to super cold, they can adapt to really hot temperatures. Um, they make variations in the kinds of houses they have or whatever. Uh, that's fine. It's the variation that people, that begins to um, take things apart. And so we have been looking at the impact of these sort of variable years, uh, which uh, is one of the things that began to happen around AD 270. Um, the less hardy species that the Romans had moved north were some of the first casualties. Um, the empire, as it began to come apart, and it wasn't just not being able to uh, to feed the masses, there were also lots of other things going, excuse me, going on. Uh, then uh, peasants began to abandon the farmland; they couldn't, uh, they couldn't um, uh, pay their debts, and the farmland reverted to scrub and forest, which uh, stayed pretty much that way until uh, the 800s or so before it. Before it. There were some uh, successful adaptive strategies at this sort of um, social level. In the Little Ice Age, um, uh, farms in Burgundy had a, a kind of an early hippie commune approach. And uh, they all lived together. Uh, each family had its own 
room, and they made sort of um, sort of snake-like rooms along the edges of um, uh, of um, the um, of the ridge, so that they were protected from the north wind, and all of the front doors faced the southwest, so that they were warm in the winter, uh, and they cooked together. And they also uh, elected managers from their number uh, to, keep, uh, to keep everything running smoothly. And so this is what they did to get them through a very, very difficult period uh, in the Little Ice Age. And again, we, since we, we know a lot about uh, population fluctuations, we can see how quickly the population recovered from that and, and lots of other things. Uh, we also know that uh, up until probably 60 years ago or so, this area had uh, an, an enormous number of ponds. And um, I don't know how well you can see this, but um, this is an old map from, uh, from 1750 or so. And uh, these are all ponds with dams across them here. Here is the little um, Lucigny, the little pond that I just showed you. That's where the little chateau sits. And that sort of a star thing is uh, a sign for a mill. And so uh, this Cassini map then gives us an idea that the place was full of ponds. And we know in the Middle Ages that they uh, put sh uh, fish that were uh, growing in the ponds, that were living in the ponds, in barrels and shipped them down uh, the Loire River to the great chateaus. And so uh, they were shipping live fish from, uh, from upstream then. And today, uh, those ponds are pretty much gone. And what has happened uh, is some pressure that I'll talk about in just a minute uh, to, um, to increase herd size of Charolais cattle. So most of those, they, we've moved from uh, something like uh, 200 of those ponds uh, in the 18th century uh, to six uh, now. Um, Burgundy's always raised uh, grazers of one sort or another, um, horses and cattle 2,500 years ago, uh, Charolais cattle and sheep uh, today. And the subsidies uh, for the European Union, I don't need to tell you, are tied uh, for the most part to herd size and herd structure. And uh, these are, um, these are, um, uh, the, they have a herd book, and so it's very important for these farmers to keep the herd structure uh, over long periods of time, and this is something that families take uh, quite, quite seriously. And in fact, most of these farms are still family-owned, uh, and they, uh, what has been happening since um, around 1970 uh, is that the size of farms has been increasing from 30, 40 hectares to now up, it's still going up. So it's about 150 hectares now. And uh, the number of farms have been decreasing uh, from uh, over 100 in 1970 uh, now to um, probably about 15. And uh, Another thing that I've seen over the three decades or so that I've been working in this area is uh, that the kind of specialization that characterized the 1970s and the 1980s in terms uh, not only of the products that were produced, goat cheese and, and um, rabbits and um, other small fowl, uh, those have all disappeared. And part of that is European Union related, as I'm sure many of you know. But there are other factors as well. There are few peop fewer people on the farm to take care of those small animals. Um, the price of having a, uh, a milking parlor and those sorts of things that are EU standards uh, put uh, ladies uh, like, like this lady uh, pretty much out of business. And also these ladies who uh, were um, selling at the markets. A few people keep, their, keep animals for their own family. But for the most part, this has now uh, 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 disappeared from, uh, from farm income. And so more and more the farm income is 
classically uh, European Union subsidies and not so much these other things that tended to buffer people in, in hard times. I've also done a lot of work on gardens and one of the things that occurred to me is that uh, gardens are, are like little microcosms of what the farms used to be like. Uh, they have enormous variety in them. And um, this, this garden here, I spent a lot of time in this garden uh, because it took me a long time to find the 400 varieties of um, everything from lettuce and beans to red currants. Uh, in, uh, in this land. And um, what they're doing is in many ways retaining at a sort of a scale of an, almost a model the way that the landscape was diversified uh, in the past. Uh, I, I worried at first because all these farmers, uh, these are, were old guys, you know, and I thought, gosh, what's going to happen to those wonderful gardens when they are gone? I found out, to my great pleasure, that uh, the old people teach their grandchildren. The grandchildren play in the garden and learn all these sorts of things, and then they discover, you know, other things, and uh, they don't pay, pay any attention to gardens for 20 years or so. And by about the time they're 40 or 35 or whatever, they start gardening, and they remember all that stuff that they got taught. So there's still lots of gardeners, and uh, many of them are a vigorous 45 instead of these guys here. Uh, so I was able to document this flip that I saw in the way that things have been going, because now, um, the barns are enormously expensive. Uh, uh, young farmers, even for their own family farm, uh, must complete four years of formal agricultural training uh, before they can take over the family farm. Now, they could manage the farm, but they're not going to get any European sub subsidies if they do that. So, uh, Their debt is enormous. I, I know several farmers who are a million euros in debt. Um, and it doesn't go so well in the family either because the older retired farmers who are their, their parents uh, think that this is crazy and that, that they're really taking a big risk in carrying that much debt. They're also very much uh, pressured to specialize in lots of different ways. Uh, the farms are monitored by satellite and this infuriates the farmers. It makes it very unpleasant. One farmer friend of mine was furious one morning, and I said, what is the matter? Uh, and he said, well, yesterday uh, someone came and accused me of taking down a tree that I didn't have the right to take down. And I said, what is that about? And he said, well, three days ago there was a huge storm, and the lightning uh, split the tree in my best pasture, and I went out there and I cleaned it all up and stacked the wood so that we could burn it later on, and that was the tree. But they knew, in, in a day and a half, they knew where the tree was and they didn't know what he'd done, I, uh, but he was furious. And so that kind of, that, that's not very popular uh, with farmers. And of course, then there are uncertain markets and subsidies and threats to herd health and whatnot. So, the scale of farming in just two decades has really changed. And the real problem, and now we're back to the climate, the real problem is that uh, we have already begun to see these kinds of crazy variations. In 2003 and in 2002, there was a very, very heavy drought in Burgundy. Here's the map, here's the, the, the red is where the drought was the worst, and there is Burgundy. Uh, and that 2003 heat wave and drought killed 20,000 people in France, right? So this was not, uh, I was there, it was dreadful. The temperature rose to almost 50 degrees in the afternoon. It was, I've never, it was like living in hell. And um, so this is, this is the same hill uh, with cattle on it in 2003, where it looks like the Sahara, and in 2008, where it looks like it usually does, which is more like Ireland. And this uh, dominance of the Mediterranean regime, the, the hot subtropical one from the south there, 
uh, was one that started in February. That, that was a drought that was on top of a drought the year before. And um, people began to have to sacrifice their animals. It completely screwed up herd structure because they, uh, I mean, they, they were uh, bringing in hay from Belgium uh, at great cost, and it simply wasn't, it, it wasn't sustainable. Um, and so they lost, um, some people lost nearly half of their herds of um, somewhere around 200 cattle. Uh, and so what we see then is the intensified land use, like losing those marshy uh, areas that used to be ponds uh, and, putting, and putting more cattle on them, uh, removing hedgerows so that they can put a few more cattle on them, uh, and then in combination with the climate, the really amazing climate, uh, you get enormous floods uh, in the river valleys. And so here's 2007, which was a crazy year in the other direction. This is the norm for rainfall. And you can see that what happened was that it just rained and rained and rained and rained and rained. And, uh, and that, that also has a horrible effect, as you might imagine, on uh, uh, it's not good for the cattle. Uh, they have hoof diseases and, and whatnot. But the other thing is that they try and grow as much of the um, food for the cattle on their farms. And so that makes it uh, more difficult to get that in, too. So we're in a period where the variation is, uh, maybe it's not quite like AD 270, but on the other hand, we should be very, very careful at this point because there are a lot of things that are very similar. One of them is that we're monocropping. In this case, at Charolais, with the Romans, it was wheat. Um, we know that, um, that weather extremes we can handle, but not these kinds of short-term conditions. And uh, with a climatologist colleague of mine, uh, we figured out that the most variable period in French history uh, was a decade before the French Revolution. You remember, let them eat cake and all of that, right? So uh, we have to look at the possibility of connecting particularly certain kinds of commodities. And uh, uh, Thomas Friedman just had a, a March 2nd article in the New York Times uh, this week. Uh, he was reviewing a book called uh, The Arab Spring and Climate Change by Anne-Marie Slaughter. And uh, what she's arguing is that it's not a one-to-one -one direct relationship, but that uh, all of those countries that we've been seeing uh, in the Middle East with great difficulties uh, were looking at skyrocketing prices for wheat. And wheat is the major import for all of those countries. In, uh, in terms of food. So uh, I think that there are some resonances in, uh, in, in today's world with some of these things that have already happened. So the bottom line here is an unpredictable climate variability e equals increased agricultural variability. So this is uh, what we've done for Burgundy. Uh, we've looked at, at the results of increased herd size. Um, it, it shifts away from that mosaic that was uh, well entrenched. Um, it destroys hedgerows and deciduous cover, which has an effect on, uh, on other species. Um, and um, it diminishes water retention in pastures, increases erosion, compromises herd health, and essentially endangers an entire regional economy. So uh, what do we do about these kinds of things? One of the things that we could do that would be very useful is to argue for uh, shifts in, in the cap that include regional uh, analysis, like I've done here, rather than the one-size-fits-all that uh, includes uh, Spain and Belgium in the same, uh, in, in the same context for uh, what time of the year certain kinds of things happen and uh, sometimes even specific dates that you have to have trimmed your hedgerow by then or whatever. And, and so I think that the, the only way that we could do that kind of region by region approach is to drop back and look at the way that a particular region has responded 
uh, over a, a much longer period of time. And so I'm arguing that uh, there's a lot of information that we can get from the history of these landscapes that would allow us to be much better at picking the, uh, the ways uh, that those landscapes are used in the future and, uh, and seeing these kinds of patterns that recur. For example, uh, ruminants on this uh, kind of rocky, not really very deep soiled sort of environment and what happens to it when something else is planted there or when, some, when it's used in a different way. So this is what I'm trying to do, is to learn those lessons and apply them forward. And uh, I have been working with a, a group called Euragri, which uh, uh, I'm a sort of honorary Swedish member of Euragri. Uh, and uh, what I've noticed is that the people who are really eager to use this kind of an approach are people who still have a lot of their farming systems intact. So Eastern Europeans, uh, Romania, Croatia, um, Crete, places like that, that, uh, that hold in their own social memory the ways that that landscape could be best used. Okay, thank you very much.